بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين وسبحان الله العلي العظيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستنصره ونستنجده فانه حق فانه حق من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له ونصلي ونسلم ونبارك على الحبيب المصطفى النبي الامين المرسل رحمه للعالمين وعلى اله الاطهار الميامين وعلى صحبه المختارين وعلى من اتبعه باحسان الى يوم الدين اللهم يا رب اللهم يا علي عظيم اللهم لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد ان هديتنا بعد اذ ان هديتنا انك انت الرؤوف الرحيم onus as created beings and as human beings that have been given this monumental charge this remarkable remarkable um sanctified blessed honored but yet remarkably challenging and burdensome charge of being khulafa fi al-ard of being god's viceroys god's deputies god's representatives god's inheritors on earth again it is stating the abc's of islamic theology when we remind ourselves that this earth and everything in it or on it everything around it everything that can be seen from it and unseen belongs to god it is god's it is not yours it is not mine it doesn't belong to a nation it doesn't belong to a people it doesn't belong to a clan a kind it belongs to god but we have been given a remarkable deputyship and a remarkable license and a remarkable permission and an legal instrument a moral instrument of sorts that we inherit the earth not on our own behalf not to do our own will not to discharge what we want or what we wish not even to serve ourselves but to serve the will of the owner of the thing as agents as deputies what a wondrous challenge blessing an honorific position because if you are the deputy of a primary if you are the agent of a principle you in everything you do you reflect upon this principle as the duly authorized agent and this is for every single human being poor or rich healthy or ill muslim or non-muslim 
every single human being living on the face of this earth, a deputy, a khalifa, of the owner, of the maker, of the creator. Those who read history as a matter of habit, or those who study history, it becomes readily available that evaluating, assessing the performance of an agent of God, the performance of a deputy of God, often takes centuries to be properly viewed and properly understood. In the living moment, in the contemporaneous moment, in the moment in which an agent live, whether this agent is an individual or the collectivity, a group of agents all together, how well they perform the role or how badly they perform the role, the impact of their agency, how truthful, how valuable to the principle, the extent to which an agent has done the principle, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, justice in performing his or her duties as an agent, the truth of the matter, the inescapable, proof, the inescapable truth is that most assessments done contemporaneously in the living moment turn out to be so short-sighted, so incomplete that in fact, they turn out to be for the most part, I don't want to say wrong, but for the most part, exactly incomplete, remarkably partial. And it takes centuries for us to start understanding what the, the, the quality of the agency is. And the relationship between the agent and the principal, between the relationship between the principal, Allah Ta'ala subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the agent, the Khalifa of Allah on this earth. And again, from an Islamic point of view, the only way we can really assess this agency is to have an understanding of what the principle, the owner of creation wills, what the owner of creation wants. In other words, the purposes, the objectives, the moral and legal charge of the principle to the agent. What is it that the principle actually wanted from the agent on God's Mulk, God's ownership. And then assessing what in fact that agent has succeeded in achieving or have failed in achieving. And living through the historical moment itself is, if nothing else, remarkably challenging because among many other things, the information that you receive, the flow of information, as you are living through the historical moment, is so incomplete, so partial, that a proper assessment of your own agency, as you are living through it, is exactly that, so incomplete and so difficult to in fact evaluate.
This is particularly important in these historical periods in which the agent, the human being, is born in a historically challenging moment, like our moment today. In this historical moment, if you are even half alive, if you have any consciousness whatsoever, you are immediately struck by the overwhelming tragedy and trauma. The procession of mutilated, broken, destroyed lives is overwhelming and soul numbing as we every single day witness new victims to Israel and its bombardment of the Palestinians, whether in the West Bank or Gaza, its unending slaughter in Lebanon, even the destruction of historical sites in the historical city of Baalbek in Lebanon, truly overwhelming. As you watch the news of ships carrying weapons and ammunition for the Israeli army passing through the Suez Canal, and the entirely spineless and useless Egyptian government letting ships loaded with weapons to, for Israel so that they continue, so that Israel can continue its genocide against Palestinians passing through the Suez Canal and the Egyptian government basically, as always, entirely useless. Complicit, entirely complicit, in most, supposedly a Muslim government, entirely complicit in the genocide of their Muslim brothers and sisters. Of course, you are fully aware of the flow of goods through Jordan to Israel, as the Jordanian government is complicit in the genocide unfolding in Palestine and now Lebanon. And as you sit in this historical moment, remembering your agency, remembering that you are but on this earth, not to exercise your own will, but to give effect to the will of the owner of the thing, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not to serve your own interests, but to serve God's interests, as you sit in this historical moment, and you reflect upon the fact that it is not just that the Egyptian government is complicit in the genocide that has let these ships pass through the Suez Canal, carrying loaded with arms and missiles and bullets and whatever else to perpetuate the genocide, but that an entire people, over a hundred million people, the Egyptian people are in deep slumber. The non-reaction, and I am sure born out of fear and terror of the Egyptian people, and as you sit there reflecting upon your viceroyship, your agency, I am here not to carry out my own will, 
not to serve my own interests, but the will of the principle, the will of the source that gave me this agency. And you watch the deep slumber of Muslims in countries like Egypt, knowing fully well that the weapons are heading to Israel. A hundred million people are so terrorized, living in such fear, in such gripping terror, that they do not dare say a one word of protest. They do not dare question anything or voice any type of objection to the complicity of their own government in the perpetuation of an ongoing genocide. One other snapshot, if you will. There have been a lot of disturbance, civil disturbance in the Netherlands and in France. This is because for some reason there is the Europe, European soccer championship. Well, whatever the reason is, but Israel apparently is allowed to participate in the European soccer championship. And as a result, Israeli team has been, has played in the Netherlands and is um, slated to play in France and Italy, and there is news, there is constant news of protesters against the participation of Israeli teams, whether in the Netherlands or France or Italy, and there has been ensuing clashes and violence between the, um, the, um, supporters of these Israeli teams and protesters uh, all over Europe ob objecting and protesting the participation of Israeli teams because of the genocide. And of course, you are fully cognizant as you sit with your agency, with your khilafa, of the fact that in most Muslim countries, these protests, if an Israeli team came to play in Egypt or came to play in the Emirat or came to play in Jordan or came to play in the majority of Muslim countries, in these very Muslim countries, you wouldn't even have the protests that we see in Europe people wouldn't dare. So it's a historical moment that is resoundingly defeating. So defeating, so overwhelmingly defeating that you are tempted to say, well, there is very little that I can do. And in embracing the idea of your own ineptitude and inability, the very idea of your agency, the very idea of your khilafa will become diluted beyond recognition. Because if the agent basically tells himself or herself, you know, I, 
I have this charge. I have this marching orders that I was given by the principal. But I don't see myself as able or capable. I don't see myself as having, in fact, much power or much ability. And therefore, the agent fails, but doesn't fail because of malfeasance, doesn't fail necessarily because of negligence, but fails because of defeatism, fails because the agent is convinced that there is very little, if anything, to do in serving, in performing, in discharging this agency. As I've, always, as I've said so many times, history is a great educator. History often speaks to us and educates us. And in fact, history is also capable of liberating us only if we become humble students of history. So in the midst of this defeatist moment, if you will, I was reading the poetry of a most fascinating and enigmatic figure from Islamic history. Ahmadu Bamba, also known as the servant of the Prophet. Ahmadu Bamba is a man from West Africa, from the Senegal, who lived in the late 18th, lived in the late 19th century. He died, passed away, I think, in 1920s, 1924, I believe. And he is born in a very historically challenging moment. Again, in one of those historical moments in which the temptation to give up on everything the temptation to say, well, I do not know what the meaning of this agency is, and so I'm just going to do what's good for me and forget everything else. But Ahmed Wemba, he was born during French colonialism in the Senegal, when France had occupied the Senegal, and France was deliberately, purposely eradicating and destroying, erasing all nativist culture in the Senegal and West Africa generally, but in the Senegal particularly, including everything that has to do with Islam. Ahmed Ubemba founded, well, he, I mean, he, he belonged already to a well-established Sufi order, but he founded his own brand or his own branch of Sufism that exists still today. In fact, he founded an entire city where he's buried now, the city of Toba, where every year, at a minimum of a million people perform pilgrimage to his gravesite and to his mosque 
in the city of Toba. In fact, I've read, but I have not seen, that the followers of Ahmed Bemba even have an annual, um, uh, an annual, um, what do you call it, uh, procession or an annual uh, public celebration. Um, the word is escaping me, the word I'm looking for, but anyway, um, in New York City, uh, that, that's what I've read, but I don't know, I haven't seen it. But it's probably true. I mean, his followers count in the millions. And there are a lot of fascinating things about Ahmed Umabba and his historical moment. But one of them is that he was a pacifist. He adopted the position that if I take on the French militarily, they will eradicate me and adopted nonviolent opposition to the French. They ended up exiling him for many years, which his followers, his part, his whole story and exile and back and forth with the French is all part of his. But the part that I was focusing on was his poetry. And I was reading his poetry, trying to understand a little bit of what this man in that historical period, where so much of Islam could have been lost in the synagogue, but yet through his message, through his character, through his persona, not only did he preserve Islam in the synagogue, but he created a lasting moment, movement that has rooted Islam in West Africa deeper in opposition to French influence and did it powerfully. What was it about this man? And I was struck in reading his poetry by something that I want to share with you. Most of his poetry is a love homily for the Prophet ﷺ. His poetry is not incidental to his message. It is actually at the core of his message. Ahmed Ubemba's followers recite their, his poetry regularly in dhikr. His poetry and the impact of his poetry far exceeds any of his other, other writings and is extricately intertwined with his entire message And so much of this poetry is a love poem to the Prophet ﷺ. And you pause there and you think about at that time of great historical challenge and tribulation. Ahmed Bemba's solution, the key that, the key that provided him 
with the power of his agency was to love the Prophet Muhammad is it that simple? Is it that straightforward? Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah At-Tawbah, لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ Allah have sent you a prophet, one amongst you. A prophet from your midst, one of you. Azizun alayhi ma haristum. This prophet Azizun alayhi ma haristum means worrying about your welfare, living with your problems literally from min one minute to the other. Azizun alayhi ma haristum is what, what you are burdened by burdens this prophet. It is like saying your well-being is part of his well-being. He carries your problems on his back because there is no difference between what is what are his problems and your problems. Bil mu'minina ra'ufun rahim. The very nature of this prophet is that with the believers, he is Ra'uf and Rahim. Well, let's pause for a second here. Ra'uf and Rahim, Ra'fa is kindness, compassion, gentleness, tenderness, a rahma is mercy. So what is the character of this prophet? With the believers, he is, his, his, his deliberate uh, due course is rafa and rahma, is gentleness, care, giving, compassion, his problems or your problems are his problems. And he is constantly with you, a source of mercy and compassion. Rafa and Rahma cannot exist without love. So he cares so much about you that he is in a constant giving mode of generosity and kindness and mercy and compassion. Excuse me. There is Early on in Islamic history, there occurred a dispute of some relevance here. And this is shortly after the Prophet ﷺ died, when in the same surah, Surah Tawbah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs the Prophet to collect the zakah from people. And Allah tells the Prophet, collect these alms, collect these taxes to purify, so that you will purify them. 
And then Allah adds, and pray for them, telling the Prophet, pray for your followers, because your prayer is second on lahum, is a source of tranquility and goodness and well-being for them. Well, after the Prophet died, as is well known, during the Khilafah of Abu Bakr, the whole tribes said, the man who used to pray for us and whose prayer was a source of tranquility for us, Sakanun Lana, has died. And now that he's dead, we refuse to give alms to the central state, to, to Khalifa Abu Bakr, because and the circumstances have changed now, and the the logic or the reason to etch, the reason to be for paying these taxes in order for the Prophet to pray for us, or because the Prophet prayed for us, doesn't exist anymore. And this in part led to the wars known as the apostasy wars. But I'm not interested in the political controversy and the political uh, um, dispute. But this conflict raised this issue, a, a theological issue. Is the prayer of the Prophet والسلام, that statement that the prayers of the Prophet is a source of goodness and tranquility for his ummah end with the death of the Prophet? Or does it continue beyond his death? Let me put the issue different way. Allah tells us in the Quran that you might not realize this, but those who die as martyrs in Allah's past are actually not dead. But that they continue living with their Lord. Muslim theologians raise the very logical and common sense issue of, well, if the martyrs, and the reason they're known as martyrs is because they witness. And if because of their testimony, because of their witnessing and sacrificing their lives in the process of witnessing, they are not in fact dead, but they continue living with their Lord. A priori, how about the Prophet That will it make sense that martyrs continue living with their Lord while we believe that the Prophet is dead and gone? So, again, sit with the theological issue for a second. Would it make sense that the Prophet is no more while those who witnessed in his cause the cause of the Prophet, in fact, continue living. And this was part of the theological debates about whether the Prophet ﷺ continues to exist in al Mala' al Ala, in other words, living with the Lord, and continues to be capable of praying for us in intercession, in shafa'ah, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is part of the whole debate about the intercession of the Prophet, which I don't, it, it, that's a very large topic. But I come back to Ahmad Bamba and his poetry. Unfortunately, Wahhabi slash Salafi Islam in its typically reductionist mode, reduced the Sunnah of the Prophet 
to a set of textual normative commands of what he used to wear, what retro he used to put on, whether he used the swag or not, these outer external things. But what they de-emphasized in Muslim consciousness and in Muslim awareness is a direct relationship with the Prophet ﷺ as a living example. It is impossible to write the type of poetry that Ahmadu Bamba, the Senegalese Sheikh who created a movement of millions that defeated the French in Senegal without firing a single shot. It is impossible to do that, to write that type of poetry without deep love for the Prophet and not just deep love, but an actual personal relationship, which is very evident in his poetry. What is the issue here? In one word, the issue is modeling. If you are charged with an agency, I am given, I am chosen by a principal. And let's say it's an owner of a company. Let's, not, let's even put aside that it's God. And the owner of this company says, I want you to be my legal agent. You're in charge. I'm gonna give you a set of instructions. You know, in the ear, this folder has all these instructions for you. But you go off and you make sure that these instructions are carried out. And I, as an agent, then read over the instructions. Maybe if I'm diligent, I will even spend a year studying the instructions, maybe. And then I go off. If I do not have a living existing model for that agency, the chances of failure are truly enormous. Modeling is the way we learn. To have and um, to understand the living example of the Prophet والسلام, and particularly, particularly that the philosophy of life for the Prophet والسلام, was what? حَرِيصٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِتُّمْ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَؤُوفٌ رَحِيمٌ the, the model of the Prophet والسلام, is he didn't live for himself, he didn't worry about himself, he worried about you, he carried on his back your problems as if they were his problems, and his philosophy of existence amongst you was Ra'uf Rahim, constantly kind, giving, compassionate, merciful. When I look at the example of someone like Ahmed Bamba and how he managed to have millions of followers and to defy the imperial power of France in Senegal and to create an entire city and a city that is visited by millions of people each year to honor Ahmed Bamba. And I look at his legacy and his legacy amongst his followers 
is precisely a model modeled after the Prophet ﷺ. Amongst his followers, what distinguished him was his ra'fa and rahmah, was his kindness, his giving nature, his compassion, his selflessness in, ser in service. When the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ becomes superficial prescriptions that we imitate without a soul, without a spirit. So when it becomes what you wear, when it becomes even what you, how you cover, when it becomes a, how you clean your teeth, what itr you put on, what you know, musk you put on, but without modeling that philosophy of agency in life, the ra'fa and rahmah, your agency in turn becomes as if a walk in the wilderness. You are completely lost. You are without an anchor. You have this agency, but you don't know what to do with it because it is an agency without a model. You have a book of instructions, but your mind can recast these instructions in a million different ways. And so when Allah tells you that what I need is the, the, the way you interact and relate to others is through Rafa and Rahma. Without a model, your mind can philosophize this in a million different ways. I submit to you that if you have a personal relationship with the Prophet ﷺ, if you love the Prophet ﷺ, if you relate to the model of the Prophet ﷺ, like Ahmad Bamba did, the amazing man from Senegal, your agency starts having a pathway that is far more clear, that is far more precise and indeed indeed I do believe that the Prophet ﷺ lives with his Lord like the martyrs and I do believe that when Allah tells us that the intercession of your prophet, the prayers of your prophet is a source of good for you. When we abandon these prayers, when we abandon a relationship, so we are not the recipients of this blessing anymore, we do so only to our own detriment. And the consequences are the type of uprootedness and loss of spirit and soul that we witness all over the Muslim world today. At these trying times, the love homilies of Ahmad Ubamba are truly anchoring inspiring, beyond belief. A man just loving the Prophet ﷺ. And then you remember that this love defied the power of French colonialism, resisted French colonialism without firing a shot. 
May we always learn from the models and examples that Allah has set on this earth for us. اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على النبي الأمين خاتم الرسل والأنبياء أجمعين المرسل رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله الأطهار الميامين وعلى أصحابه المختارين وعلى من اتبعوا بإحسان إلى يوم الدين There is a another, there is a an, yet another Israeli illegal settlement in the Golan Heights, the occupied Golan Heights. This settlement is known is named Trump, honoring President Trump, because President Trump, although in in con, in, in contravention of international law, as if international law matters, but in direct violation of every interpretation of international law known to humanity. Trump, in his past presidency, recognized Israel's annexation of the Golan Heights, basically told Israel, hey, you illegally conquered this land in 67. The Golan Heights, of course, are, is part of Syria, has always been a part of Syria. I'm going to reward you for illegally conquering it by recognizing your annexation of this territory as yours, as part of Israel. Israel was so ecstatic that they created a settlement and they named it after Trump. And of course, Trump also recognized Israel's annexation of Jerusalem, East and West, and told Israel, you have a right to all of Jerusalem. I don't care that the Oslo Accord said Palestinians' capital is going to be part of Jerusalem. Trump said, no, it's all yours. Don't worry about it. Forget about the Palestinians. And it was also during the Trump presidency that Trump sent his son-in-law, Kushner, to drink and dine and wine with MBZ and MBS and to create the deal of the century and basically say, let's all hug and kiss with the Israelis and forget the Palestinians completely. They don't matter. This was all part of Trump's legacy. And I can't but make a comment about the recent elections. I don't need to say much about the obscenity of voting for a representative of the administration that is completely complicit in the genocide that is taking place. Genocide Joe is not just a funny turn of a phrase. He is really Genocide Joe because that administration fully enabled and empowered the Israeli genocide by basically opening up the American coffers to Israel and saying, don't worry, we will replenish all your missiles, we will replenish all your bullets, any military aid you need, we will provide no limits, no questions. And as a result, and so 
I don't need to say why voting for Kamala is obscene. But so is voting for Trump. As I said, it is not a coincidence that the Israeli government and the Saudi government and the Emirati government all celebrated Trump winning the elections. And I go back to this modeling issue. As Allah's agent on this earth, as I am, I am God's deputy on the earth. I am Allah's Khalifa. Not by choice, but this is the charge. And as Allah's deputy, eventually I will be questioned about how I discharge this deputyship. Now, if you have an awareness of the Prophet ﷺ, you can easily imagine the question of what would have the Prophet done? Could you have imagined that if the Prophet ﷺ was alive today, that he would have cast a vote in favor of Kamala Harris? Could you have imagined that the Prophet would vote for Trump? What is painful is that as many Muslim voters as there are in the United States, the candidate who had a Muslim running mate only got half a million votes. This is like a barometer measures temperature. This is a measure of our lack of solidarity and our disintegration as an ummah. How could a candidate who chose a Muslim running mate all over the US receive only half a million votes? If the Prophet ﷺ was living amongst us, what would you imagine that Prophet would tell us about our relationship to power in a place like the United States. Remember that we have already established that his philosophy of existence, that the very philosophy for the Prophet's existence is Ra'fa and Rahma, is compassion, Kindness. What would be a very beneficent, compassionate, kind, empathetic human being? What would be their position? Would they vote for Kamala? Would they vote for Trump? What would they tell you about the fact that a fellow Muslim, an articulate, smart Muslim, is out there trying to cut a path in the dense forest of American politics. Am I saying that your response to
to the trauma and misery that we are all witnessing right now today is to love the Prophet and strengthen our relationship to the Prophet Yes, that is what I'm saying. Yes. Sometimes when the world is so full of hate, the only thing you can do is to love, is to feed your love, to nourish your love. To love that who is worthy of love. And the man who Allah told us was sent to this ummah. The burdens of this ummah is indistinguishable from his own burdens, who models for us moral life and moral existence, what it, it is to be, to live morally. As Allah told him, عظيم, that you are a man of great ethics. Well, the man who models these ethics, can you imagine if Muslim rulers would have learned from the Prophet and if the way they led was through Ra'fa and Rahmah, as the Allah tells the Prophet, through systematic course of kindness and compassion, if anything, we look at Muslim rulers and we say, God, they have no kindness. They have no beneficence. They have no compassion. When does it get through to our intellects and our hearts that the mark of the Prophet ﷺ, not just as a leader in his community, but as a neighbor, as a friend, as a family man, as a husband, as a father, was always Ra'ufun Rahim, was always this compassion, this kindness, this endlessly giving character. It speaks volumes that when Ahmad Ubamba looked around and saw that in West Africa, no one was able to resist the power, the military power of the French. The, the French dominated everywhere, were slaughtering, committed numerous genocides and numerous human rights violations, massacred countless number of people. It is remarkable. And his response was, I will love the Prophet ﷺ, and through that love, I am going to educate an entire ummah and create an entire movement of Muslims. At the time that France wanted to erase Islam from the synagogue, Ahmad Ubamba rooted Islam deeper in the Senegali soil and did so through his love songs, his love poetry to the Prophet Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allahumma ghfir lana, Allahumma afu anna, Allahumma arhamna ya Rabb al-alameen, Allahumma ahdina li akharaba min hadha rashada ya Rabb. Allah, forgive our sins, Grant us greater piety and greater understanding and greater clarity. Bless us with the love of the Prophet ﷺ. Help us understand the model of his character and to follow his model and to reproduce his compassion, his kindness, his giving nature in everything we do. يا رب العالمين صلي وسلم وبارك على محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وأقيم الصلاة